This episode of Tape Facts is sponsored by a doctor student. Need cheap labour for your ailing business? Get a student. Grandma needs some questionable boxers moving to the attic? Get a student. We've got them all. Organised Omar. Coloured pen, anyone? Not down Meg. So I've got one essay on Monday and three presentations on Tuesday and 12 seminars on Wednesday and- Damp Dave. I smell of armpits and damp towns. Nicotine Nick. What, I'm just a social smoker. <laughs> Burnt out Bob. I slept for three hours last night. Burnt out Bob with a research job. I slept for 15 minutes. 12 years ago. A fresher that's slowly realising she's in the wrong lecture theatre. Uh, the lads. Watford FC. Watford, Watford FC. FC. They are a football club that plays football in Hertfordshire. Definitely didn't come to lectures drunk Diane. <sighs> Headphones Harry. What? The granddad from the last episode. What? A physics teacher giving a lesson on SI units. What? Is the SI unit of power. Very good children. Wait, I'm not a student. Mentally ill Bill. Wait, you don't look mentally ill at all. I know. <coughs> Keeps watching YouTube videos on his phone when he should be studying... Uh, Ramon. <laughs> I'm procrastinating. And the grad student in his mid-twenties trying to balance animation with a full-time research project. <sighs> Gip Grant Mooney. A doctor student. It's not a sex thing, just very poorly named. So how about that one episode a month thing? Seems to be holding up pretty well so far, only missed the deadline like 16 times over since I went back to uni. Still, there's lots of chemistry to talk about, so grab a notepad and a pencil because we're about to get through this like Ozzy Osbourne through a ham and ketamine sandwich. Phosphorus is the second of the group 15 elements, and its name translates to light bearer in ancient Greek. So called because white phosphorus, its most common allotrope, lights up in the dark when exposed to oxygen with an eerie green glow. Phosphorus was discovered by the German alchemist Hennig Brand in the 1660s, who like most scientists of his day was trying to isolate the philosopher's stone. Brand spent years trying to make the stone, and when his savings dried up he was forced to use whatever materials he had to hand in his research, namely vials of his own urine, which he let stand for several days to increase their potency. I mean fair play to the guy, but there's much quicker ways of making your clothes smell faintly a wee. A healthy diet of Frosty Jack Cider for once, or standing within ten feet of a League of Legends player. Brand was never able to extract an elixir for eternal youth for his wee, but he was able to isolate a mysterious chalk colour resin that had a habit of violently bursting into flames in contact with air. And for a guy who lived in a time when people were still being executed for witchcraft, this discovery must have amazed and terrified him. Brand was convinced he had discovered a formula for a precursor to the Philosopher's Stone, and he jealously guarded his recipe out of fear that other people would steal the credit. We now know that Brand's mysterious resin was almost certainly a crude sample of white phosphorus, and the reason he was able to extract it from urine was down to phosphorus's role in the human diet. Phosphorus is a common mineral in protein-rich foods, particularly red meat meat, fish, and dairy products. In fact, phosphorus is so common in living organisms, it's part of schnapps, the six elements that make up 98% of all living tissue on Earth, thought absolutely essential for life as we know it to exist. Phosphorus is a vital structural component in both DNA and the membranes that surround all of the cells in your body, called phospholipid bilayers. So yeah, pretty important element, not like the human body literally wouldn't function without it or anything. Phosphorus is pretty nasty if it's allowed to build up on our bodies, but our kidneys usually stop things from getting out of hand by filtering excess phosphorus from the blood as a component of we. These days, you can find phosphorus in everything from fertilizers to pesticides to flame retardant plastics. But phosphorus has older, more sinister uses in manufacturing, and its legacy still casts a dark cloud over the technological triumphs of the Industrial Revolution. I'll say now this will probably be one of my more gruesome videos, so if you're not a big fan of gore, you're probably best giving this episode a miss. And if you are a fan of those things, come one, come all, have a good old gore at man's crimes against his fellow human beings. Popcorn to the left, peanuts in the middle, and traumatised Viet Cong soldiers to your right. Victorian Britain was not a place best known for its utopian working conditions, but you'd be hard pressed to find a trade more insidious than the matchmaking industry. In the Victorian era, matchsticks were vital from everything from lighting your home, to firing up your stove, to taking fat rips on your gentlemanly opium pipe. And hundreds of factories sprung up across the country to meet demand. Most of the work done in matchstick factories was done by women and children, as delicate hands were needed to carve the matchsticks. Sadly, the work was miserably paid, the days were brutally long, and the conditions were practically inhuman. Now, start of a ten. What horribly toxic compound were the heads of old matches made out of? 
The answer, of course, is it's a trick question, because white phosphorus is an allotrope and not a compound. See you next time! Anyway, as well as being pyrophoric, white phosphorus is crazy toxic. In modern research labs, chemists working with white phosphorus are only allowed to do so under strict instructions to handle it in a fume hood. But matchstick workers would breathe in phosphorus vapour on a daily basis, and would often come home with flecks of fluorescent phosphorus powder in their hair and teeth. If allowed to build up in the mouth, phosphorus resin will lead to osteonecrosis of the jawbone, a condition colloquially known as fossy jaw, and it was a nightmare in matchstick factories. Early symptoms were fairly mild, frequent toothaches, painful swelling in your gums, and all of your teeth falling out as they were displaced by agonising pus-filled sores. To Victorian doctors, the only treatment available was total removal of the jawbone to stop the infection from spreading, usually without anaesthetic, and always with horrific disfigurement. In 1852, an up-and-coming writer called Charles Dickens, yeah, you've probably never heard of him, don't worry about it, wrote a scathing attack on the matchstick industry, gruesomely describing the suffering of a young woman working in the factories. After two or three years, her complaint began like toothache. She had one tooth drawn, but the gum afterwards gathered and discharged outside. She had undergone five operations, her underjaw being nearly gone, the oval shape of her face is destroyed. At the same time, her upper features show she would be by nature a good-looking girl. She is obliged to live upon soft food, and is employed now in making boxes out of the way of the fumes. Good God, I know it's Dickens, but I was expecting something a bit less bleak. What lock, shall offer? cried Mr. Dimbley Dongle, the factory owner. Get back to work this instant, or balls are all bought off your bigly wigglies! The active ingredients in modern matches, or safety matches, are potassium chlorate and elemental sulphur. And instead of having white phosphorus in the match head, that little red strip you get on matchstick boxes needed to light them contains red phosphorus, a much safer allotrope. When you strike a match against the red phosphorus strip, it triggers a controllable exothermic reaction, liberating heat in the form of a flame, and, amongst other byproducts, sulfur dioxide, the gas responsible for the characteristic smell of burnt matches. It's safe to say that phosphorus is an element with a pretty grisly history. White phosphorus is still used in smoke grenades, but there's still some pretty messed up things you can do with them, and white phosphorus in incendiary devices are expressly outlawed by the Geneva Convention, but the good thing is, no atrocities were ever committed with phosphorus weapons ever again. See you all next time!